guys, my name is Chelsea and welcome back to my channel. For today's video, we're going over all the new releases I'm excited for coming out April, May, and June. like this back in December talking about the anticipated releases that I had for January, February, and March and I believe in that video I had like 35. This time I have 61. I just keep finding new books that sound super intriguing or super exciting and adding them to my want to read list on Goodreads. Now I am one of those people and I've talked about this in my videos multiple times before where I know some of what a book is about, either based on synopsis or other people on booktube, at the time that I add these things to my want to read list. However, by the time I actually get around to reading things, I do not know what they are about whatsoever. So this video is most likely going to be me reading the synopsis of these books off Goodreads. Almost every single one probably, because while I am very excited for them, I don't know if I could tell you what they're actually about. But like I said, I have 61 titles here. I'm going to be starting at the beginning of April and going to the end of June just in order. That way I feel like that's the easiest way for me to do this. And because this is going to be a long ass video, we're going to jump right on in. Okay, so I have five titles coming out on Tuesday, April 6th. The first one is The Infinity Courts by Akemi Don Bowman. And from my understanding, this is some sort of YA sci-fi. 18-year-old Nami Miyamoto is certain her life is just beginning. She has a great family, just graduated high school, and is on her way to a party where her entire class is waiting for her, including, most importantly, the boy she's been in love with for years. The only problem? She's murdered before she gets there. I don't know if I remembered this, but like I'm already very intrigued. <laughs> when Nami wakes up, she learns she's in a place called Infinity, where human consciousness goes when physical bodies die. She quickly discovers that Ophelia, a virtual assistant widely used by humans on Earth, has taken over the afterlife and is now posing as a queen, forcing humans into servitude the way she's been forced to serve in the real world. Even worse, Ophelia is inching closer and closer to accomplishing her grand plans of eradicating human existence once and for all. As Nami works with a team of rebels to bring down Ophelia and save the humans under her imprisonment, she is forced to reckon with her past, her future, and what it is that truly makes us human. Okay, this sounds really good. Again, I added these to my list. I know they sound good, but I don't remember what they're about. So I'm like refreshing my knowledge of these books at the same time I'm telling you about them. Um, and it does say that it's going to explore big questions about technology, grief, love, and humanity. Very, very excited. The next one I have on this list is Life's Too Short by Abby Jimenez. This is the third book in the Friend Zone series, which I believe are companion novels. This is, should be like an adult romance. I have not read books one or two, but this one definitely intrigued me enough to add it on my Goodreads. And this says, when Vanessa Price quit her job to pursue her dream of traveling the globe, she wasn't expecting to gain millions of YouTube followers who shared her joy of seizing every moment. For her, living each day to the fullest isn't just a motto. Her mother and sister never saw the age of 30, and Vanessa doesn't want to take anything for granted. But after her half-sister suddenly leaves Vanessa in custody of her baby daughter, life goes from daily adventure to next level bad. Now with bonus baby vomit and hair. The last person Vanessa expects to show up offering help is the hot lawyer next door, Adrian Copeland. After all, she barely knows him. No one warned her that he was the secret baby tamer or that she'd be spending a whole lot of time with him and his geriatric chihuahua. Sorry, geriatric chihuahua. I'm definitely very intrigued. Now she's feeling things she vowed not to feel because the only thing worse than falling for Adrian is finding a little hope for a future she may never see. Again, I did not read books one or two in this series. I definitely should. Like, I, I need to do that. But... This one I'm very, very excited for. Then I have The Cost of Knowing by Brittany Morris. I read Slay earlier this year, absolutely loved it. So I obviously had to add this one onto my want to read. Like Brittany Morris, I need to read another book before I can definitely say she's an autobi author, but like Slay is definitely putting her up there and I need this book. So this says Dear Martin meets They Both Die at the End. So that's very intriguing to me. 
16-year-old Alex Rufus is trying his best. He tries to be the best employee he can be at the local ice shop, the best boyfriend he can be to his amazing girlfriend Talia, the best protector he can be over his little brother Isaiah, but as much as Alex tries, he often comes up short. It's hard for him to be present when every time he touches an object or person, Alex sees into its future. When he touches a scoop, he has a vision of him using it to scoop ice cream. When he touches his car, he sees it years from now, totaled and underwater. When he touches Talia, he sees them at the precipice of breaking up, and that terrifies him. Alex feels these visions are a curse, distracting him, making him anxious, and unable to live an ordinary life. And when Alex touches a photo that gives him a vision of his brother's imminent death, everything changes. With Alex now in a race against time, death, and circumstances, he and Isaiah must grapple with their past, their future, and what it means to be young black men in America in the present. I definitely got chills reading this. And so, yeah, another sort of YA, sci-fi-ish, fantasy, magical realism sort of thing. I'm very, very excited about this. Next, we have House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. 17-year-old Iris Hollow has always been strange. Something happened to her and her two older sisters when they were children. Something they can't quite remember, but that left each of them with an identical half-moon scar at the base of their throats. Iris has spent most of her teenage years trying to avoid the weirdness that sticks to her like tar. But when her eldest sister Grey goes missing under suspicious circumstances, Iris learns just how weird her life can get. Horned men start shadowing her, a corpse falls out of her sister's ceiling, the ugly, impossible memories start to twist their way to the forefront of her mind. As Iris retraces Grey's last known steps and follows the increasingly bizarre trail of breadcrumbs she left behind, it becomes apparent that the only way to save her sister is to decipher the mystery of what happened to them as children. The closer Iris gets to the truth, the closer she comes to understanding that the answer is dark and dangerous and that Grey has been keeping a terrible secret from her for years. So this is definitely more mystery, thriller, potentially horror, and I do want to read more of those this year, so yes. And then I also have Earth Boy. This is by Paul Tobin, illustrations by Ron Chan. So this is one that I actually was reading way back when this first started because I've been following Ron Chan as an illustrator for years, it seems like. He actually has done some like official licensed illustrations for Mass Effect and that kind of thing. So um, I've been following him for a while. And this is one that I was following as it was like updating on, oh, what was it? It was like a Kickstarter like weekly thing. I don't really remember, but the actual site that they were using for that shut down or it wasn't getting used enough. So I have not followed it enough lately. I don't even know if they're still doing like current updates on it or if it's just coming out as a book. Is this just one book? Because I know it's supposed to be like a graphic novel comic type thing um, about a boy who is human and gets accepted to an alien school. Um, and so yes. Benson, young teen boy with dreams of venturing into space and becoming a galactic ranger, is given the chance to make his hopes a reality when he's selected to join an elite academy full of strange characters and unusual alien classmates. But when a combination of culture shock, bullying, and administrative secrets shake his confidence, Benson must dig deep and fight to prove he belongs. So I don't know how much that I've already read will be in this, but I do know that the part that I read before was really cute. This definitely feels more like middle grade comic, potentially young adult at the most. I'm just ready for it. And now we're moving on to April 13th. I have three titles for this date. The first one is Victories Greater Than Death by Charlie Jane Anders. I do believe this is a young adult sci-fi. It's a thrilling adventure set against an intergalactic war. Think Star Wars meets Doctor Who and buckle your seatbelts. Like I'm very, very intrigued already. Tina has always known her destiny is outside the norm. After all, she is the human clone of the most brilliant alien commander in all of the galaxies even if the rest of the world is still deciding whether aliens exist. Okay, human clone of an alien. That definitely seems interesting. But she is tired of waiting for her life to begin, and then it does. And maybe Tina should have been more prepared. At least she has a crew around her that she can trust, and her best friend at her side. Now they just have to save the world. <laughs> okay, not very much information about this. However, the fact that it is Star Wars meets Doctor Who is very, very intriguing. And I love sci-fi, so I definitely need to read this. And the cover is gorgeous. Okay, and then we have The Summer of You, Volume 1. So this is going to be a new manga. This is by Nagisa Furuya. 
and it says a wistful summer blossoms between two high school boys finding themselves and each other through a shared love of movies. Chiharu Saeki and Watro Toda are two high school students who share a common hobby. They love to watch movies. After they meet, they become fast friends until one day when Chiharu confesses his love for Wataru. Wataru says that Chiharu's confession doesn't bother him, and the boys continue throughout their summer going to pilgrimages to see film spots from their favorite movies. But the more time he spends with Chiharu, Wataru realizes that he may not only be as unaffected by Chiharu's confession as he claims to be, but those feelings may also be mutual. So I do love when we have some manga that is LGBTQ, or I guess this could also be considered boys love. Um, it seems like it should be a very cute boy's love, because I don't like it when we sort of toe the line into non-consensual stuff, but I'm excited to try this one out. And then we also have The Mary Shelley Club by Goldie Moldavsky. So I've read two other Goldie Moldavsky books, and I think I've given them both around three and a half or four stars, but this one seems to intrigue me the most, because I'm pretty sure this was more of a, like, a dark academia thriller type of book. Scream meets Karen McManus. Yes, okay. New girl Rachel Chavez is eager to make a fresh start at Manchester Prep, but as one of the few scholarship kids, Rachel struggles to fit in, and when she gets caught up in a prank gone awry, she ends up with more enemies than friends. To her surprise, however, the prank attracts the attention of the Mary Shelley Club, a secret club of students with one objective come up with the scariest prank to orchestrate real fear. But as the pranks escalate, the competition turns cutthroat and takes on a life of its own. When the tables are turned and someone targets the club itself, Rachel must track down the real-life monster in their midst, even if it means finally confronting the dark secrets from her past. Again, yes, I want to read more dark, thrillery type books, and I like the author's writing style before. And then I have six titles coming out on April 20th. The first one we have here is Defect by Nino Cipri. This one is a sequel to Finna. These are both novellas, and I believe I have read that they are companions, like they're set in the same place, but you do not have to read them together. I do want to read Finna, but this is the one coming out this year. And it says, Derek is Littenvarld's most loyal employee. He lives and breathes a job from the moment he wakes up in a converted shipping container at the edge of the parking lot to the second he clocks out of work 18 hours later. But after taking his first ever sick day, his manager calls that loyalty into question. An excellent employee like Derek, an employee made to work at Littenvarld, shouldn't need time off. To test his commitment to the job, Derek is assigned a special inventory shift, hunting through the store to find defective products. Toy chests with pincers and eye stocks, ambulatory sleeper sofas, killer mutant toilets, that kind of thing. Helping him is the inventory team, four strangers who look and sound almost exactly like him. Are five Derricks better than one? So, from my understanding, like I said, these are novellas, but I believe these are like sci-fi-ish novellas set in a sort of Ikea store. And I definitely want to read both of them. Then we also have The Forest of Stolen Girls by June Her. And this one I do believe is a YA mystery, but I think it's also historical. Huani's family has never been the same since she and her younger sister went missing and were later found unconscious in the forest near a gruesome crime scene. The only thing they remember, their captor wore a painted white mask. To escape the haunting memories of this incident, the family flees their hometown. Years later, Detective Min, Hwani's father, learns that 13 girls have recently disappeared under similar circumstances, and so he returns to their hometown to investigate, only to vanish as well. Determined to find her father and solve the case that tore her family apart, Hwani returns home to pick up the trail. As she digs into the secrets of the small village and reconnects with her now estranged sister, Hwani comes to realize that the answer lies within her own buried memories of what happened in the forest all those years ago. Then we also have a new collection from Junji Ito called Love Sickness. I absolutely love Junji Ito. This one I do believe is going to be a collection of short stories. I have tried to read everything that Junji Ito publishes in English, although I think I'm a couple books behind. Or maybe not behind, but I've missed a couple books. I need to get on that. But this is the new one coming out. And yes, it does look like this is going to be a collection of short stories. And it looks like it's going to have 10 stories. The three that are mentioned here are Love Sickness, The Strange Hikizuri Siblings, and The Rib Woman. The Rib Woman sounds horrific already. I definitely want to read this. Then we also have In Deeper Waters by F.T. Lukens. And this one says, Prince Tall has long awaited his coming of age tour. After spending most of his life cloistered behind palace walls as he learns to keep his forbidden magic secret, he can finally see his family's kingdom for the first time. 
His first taste of adventure comes just two days into the journey when their crew discovers a mysterious prisoner on a burning derelict vessel. Tasked with watching over the prisoner, Paul is surprised to feel an intense connection with the roguish Athlan. So when Athlan leaps overboard and disappears, Tal feels responsible and heartbroken, knowing Athlan could not have survived in the open ocean. That is, until Tal runs into Athlan days later on dry land, very much alive, and as charming and secretive as ever. But before they can pursue anything further, Tal is kidnapped by pirates and held ransom in a plot to reveal his rumored powers and instigate a war. Tal must escape if he hopes to save his family and the kingdom, and Athlan might just be his only hope. So this is definitely going to be LGBTQ. I did know it was supposed to be some sort of like historical fiction thing. I don't know if I remembered it was supposed to be fantasy as well, but again, cover gorgeous. I need it. Then we also have She Drives Me Crazy by Kelly Quindlin. This one I do believe is a YA contemporary, but it should also have a sapphic romance. After losing spectacularly to her ex-girlfriend in their first game since their breakup, Scotty Sajic gets into a fender bender with the worst possible person, her nemesis, the incredibly beautiful and incredibly mean Irene Abraham. Things only get worse when their nosy do-gooder moms get involved and the girls are forced to carpool together until Irene's car gets out of the shop. Their bumpy start only gets bumpier the more time they spend together, but when an opportunity presents itself for Scotty to get back at her toxic ex and climb her school's social ladder at the same time, she bribes Irene into playing along. Hijinks, heartbreak, and gay fake dating scheme for the ages. Okay, I did not know it was fake dating. I'm always here for a good fake dating trope, so yes. <laughs> and then the last one for April 20th is Witches Steeped in Gold by Shannon Smart. Driven by their order, united by their vengeance, Iraya has spent her life in a cell, but every day brings her closer to freedom and vengeance. Jasmine is the queen's daughter, but unlike her sister before her, she has no intention of dying to strengthen her mother's power. Sworn enemies, these two witches enter a precarious alliance to take down a mutual threat. But power is intoxicating, revenge is a bloody pursuit, and nothing is certain except the lengths they will go to win this game. So it is a Jamaican-inspired fantasy debut. Um, about two witches who must enter a deadly alliance to take down a common enemy. I am very, very excited. The cover, again, is gorgeous. I think you will find a theme here. If I think the cover is gorgeous, I have a higher likelihood of putting it on this list without knowing too much about it. However, this book is getting a lot of hype. I'm very, very excited for it. And then I only have one book for April 27th, which is Dial A for Aunties by Jesse Q. Sutanto. And this says it is a hilariously quirky novel that is equal parts murder mystery, rom-com, and a celebration of mothers and daughters, as well as a deep dive into Chinese Indonesian culture. When Madeline Chan ends up accidentally killing her blind date, her meddlesome mother calls for her even more meddlesome aunties to help her rid of the body. Unfortunately, a dead body proves to be a lot more challenging to dispose of than one might anticipate, especially when it is accidentally shipped in a cake cooler to the over-the-top billionaire wedding Medi, her ma, and aunties are working at an island resort on the California coastline. It's the biggest job yet for their family wedding business. Okay, I don't even know if I want to continue with this summary. I am already getting like so much information thrown at me and this definitely has potential to be hilarious. Like how do you ship a dead body to like a wedding in a cake cooler? Is that what he said? In a cake cooler. I I'm very, very intrigued. And then I have eight books listed coming out on May 4th. The first one we have here is Counting Down With You by Tashi Buyan. And this one says a reserved Bangladeshi teenager has 28 days to make the biggest decision of her life after agreeing to fake date her school's resident bad boy. How do you make one month last a lifetime? Karina Ahmed has a plan. Keep her head down, get through high school without a fuss, and follow her parents' rules, even if it means sacrificing her dreams. When her parents go abroad to Bangladesh for four weeks, Karina expects some peace and quiet. Instead, one simple lie unravels everything. Karina is my girlfriend. Tutoring the school's resident bad boy was already crossing the line, pretending to date him out of the question. But Ace Clyde does everything right. He brings her coffee in the mornings, impresses her friends without trying, and even promises to buy her a dozen books a week if she goes along with this fake dating facade. Though Karina agrees, she can't help but start counting down the days until her parents come back. T minus 28 days until everything returns to normal. But what if Karina no longer wants it to? Okay, so again, yes, fake dating trope, I am all over. Definitely excited about this. And then we also have The Ones We're Meant to Find by Joan He. And this one, don't let the cover fool you. I know this is a gorgeous cover. It is. But it doesn't scream sci-fi to me, and this is supposed to be sort of sci-fi-ish. 
C awoke on an abandoned island three years ago with no idea of how she was marooned. She only has a rickety house, an old android, and a single memory. She has a sister, and C needs to find her. STEM prodigy Casey wants escape from the science and home she once trusted. The eco-city, Earth's last unpolluted place, is meant to be sanctuary for those committed to planetary protection, but it's populated by people willing to do anything for refuge, even lie. Now she'll have to decide if she's ready to use science to help humanity, even though it failed the people who mattered most. So again, I love sci-fi. I am always all over sci-fi. I did not realize this was sci-fi when it was like first announced, but I am so excited. Then we have a new book coming out in the Rick Riordan Presents line, and this is going to be The Last Fallen Star by Gracie Kim. And this is going to be a debut about an adopted Korean-American girl who discovers her heritage and her magic on a perilous journey. Riley Oh can't wait to see her sister get initiated into the Gom Clan, a powerful lineage of Korean healing witches their family has belonged to for generations. Her sister Hattie will earn her gi bracelet and finally be able to cast spells without adult supervision. Although Riley is desperate to follow in her sister's footsteps, when she herself turns 13, she's a Sarum, a person without magic. Riley was adopted, and despite having memorized every healing spell she's ever heard, she often feels like the odd one out in her family and the gifted community. Then, Hattie gets an idea. What if the two of them could cast a spell that would allow Riley to share Hattie's magic? Their sleuthing reveals a promising incantation in the family's old spell book, and the sisters decide to perform it at Hattie's initiation ceremony. If it works, no one will ever treat Riley as an outsider again. It's the perfect plan, until it isn't. I don't want to read any more of the synopsis. I am hooked already. I love middle grade fantasy. I need to read more of it because middle grade sometimes I feel like gets put on the back burner for me compared to like YA and adults, but I love middle grade. Then we also have Meet Cute Diary by Emery Lee. Noah Ramirez thinks he's an expert on romance. He has to be for his popular blog, The Meet Cute Diary, a collection of trans happily ever afters. There's just one problem. All the stories are fake. What started as the fantasies of a trans boy afraid to step out of the closet has grown into a beacon of hope for trans readers across the globe. When a troll exposes the blog as fiction, Noah's world unravels. The only way to save the diary is to convince everyone that the stories are true, but he doesn't have any proof. Then Drew walks into Noah's life and the pieces fall into place. Drew is willing to fake date Noah to save the diary. But when Noah's feelings grow beyond their staged romance, he realizes that dating in real life isn't quite the same as finding love on the page. I am so excited. Again, fake dating trope. I think, this is this one of my favorite tropes? It must be because there's a lot on here and I'm very, very excited. Can I say excited enough? Because I'm sure I've definitely said excited too much already and we're not even halfway done. Okay, and the next one I have here is Luck of the Titanic by Stacey Lee. And so this one here is going to be some sort of Titanic story. I don't think it's a retelling. And I know I've said on my channel before I don't really like historical fiction. However, I love Titanic stuff. Like I read a lot of the like Dear America stuff when I was a kid and they had like Titanic ones and so yeah. Southampton 1912. 17 year old British Chinese Valora Luck has quit her job and smuggled herself aboard the Titanic with two goals in mind. To reunite with her twin brother Jamie, her only family now that her parents are dead, and to convince a part-time owner of the Ringling Brothers Circus to take the twins on as acrobats. Quick thinking Val talks her way into opulent first class accommodations and finds Jamie with a group of fellow Chinese laborers in third class. But in the rigidly stratified world of the luxury liner, Val's ruse can only last so long, and after two long years apart, it's unclear if Jamie even wants the life Val proposes. Then one moonless night in the North Atlantic, the unthinkable happens. The supposedly unsinkable ship is dealt a fatal blow, and Val and her companions suddenly find themselves in a race to survive. Like I said, I'm a sucker for Titanic stuff. I don't know for sure exactly why, but if a historical fiction is set with Titanic stuff, I want it. Then I also have here When You Get the Chance by Tom Ryan. As kids, Mark and his cousin Talia spent many happy summers together at the family cottage in Ontario, but a fight between their parents put an end to the annual event. Living on opposite coasts, Mark in Halifax and Talia in Victoria, they haven't seen each other in years. When their grandfather dies unexpectedly, Mark and Talia find themselves reunited at the cottage once again, cleaning it out while the family decides what to do with it. Mark and Talia are both queer, but they soon realize that's about all they have in common, other than the fact that they both prefer to be in Toronto. 
Tali is desperate to see her high school sweetheart Aaron, who's barely been in touch since leaving to spend the summer working at a coffee shop in the gay village. Mark, on the other hand, is just looking for some fun, and Toronto Pride seems like the perfect place to find it. When a series of complications throws everything in the air, Mark and Talia, with Mark's little sister Paige in tow, decide to hit the road for Toronto. With a bit of luck and some help from a series of unexpected new friends, they might just make it to the big city and find what they're looking for. That is, if they can figure out how to start seeing things through each other's eyes. So this just sounds like a really cute YA contemporary road trip sort of story, um, and yes. <laughs> then I also have Seven Secrets Volume 1 by Tom Taylor, illustrations by Danielle Danuclo. Hopefully I'm pronouncing her name right. And this says, Seven Secrets Will Change the World. For centuries, the Order has trusted in keepers and holders to guard the secrets in seven briefcases against all harm. But when their stronghold is attacked and the secrets are put in peril, the entire Order must face their greatest fear, an enemy who knows too much and is willing to kill to get what he wants. Now the Order's newest member, Casper, must discover the truth of the secrets before the enemy does, or risk losing everything. So this, I'm pretty sure, is a comic bind-up but the art style on the cover looks amazing and it just seems intriguing and it's by Boom Studios which is one of my favorite comic publishers. And the last one for this date is Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Now I don't know how many people know this um, but I have never actually read an Andy Weir and I know The Martian is like super super popular but I just never picked it up but this one also seems very intriguing. Ryland Grace is the sole survivor on a desperate last chance mission and if he fails humanity and the earth itself will perish. Except that right now he doesn't know that. He can't even remember his own name, let alone the nature of his assignment or how to complete it. All he knows is that he's been asleep for a very, very long time. And he's just been awakened to find himself millions of miles from home with nothing but two corpses for company. And his crewmate's dead, his memories fuzzily returning, he realizes that an impossible task now confronts him. Alone on this tiny ship that's been cobbled together by every government and space agency on the planet and hurled into the depths of space, it's up to him to conquer an extinction level threat to our species. And thanks to an unexpected ally, he might just have a chance. Part scientific mystery, part dazzling interstellar journey, Project Hail Mary is a tale of discovery, speculation, and survival to rival The Martian while taking us to places it never dreamed of going. So again, I haven't read The Martian, however, this sounds super intriguing. Like, I definitely want to pick this up. Moving on to May 11th, I have five titles coming out on this date. The first is Blackwater Sister by Zen Cho. Jessamine Teo is closeted, broke, and moving back to Malaysia, a country she left when she was a toddler. So when Jess starts hearing voices, she chalks it up to stress. But there's only one voice in her head, and it claims to be the ghost of her estranged grandmother, Ama. In life, Ama was a spirit medium, the avatar of a mysterious deity called the Blackwater Sister. Now she's determined to settle a score against a gang boss who has offended the god, and she's decided Jess is going to help her do it. Drawn into a world of gods, ghosts, and family secrets, Jess finds that making deals with capricious spirits is a dangerous business. As Jess fights for retribution for Ama, she'll also need to regain control of her body and destiny. If she fails, the Blackwater sister may finish her off for good. Again, stunning cover, and I'm very intrigued by this premise. Next, we have We Only Find Them When They're Dead, Volume 1, by Al Ewing and Simone DeMio for illustrations. Now this, as far as I'm aware, is also a comic bind-up, and I've had this on my list for a while because the cover definitely makes me think sci-fi. Like, there's obviously a spaceship here, right? And so, um, yes. <laughs> Captain Alec and the crew of the spaceship, the Vahan 2, are in search of the only resources that matter and can only be found by harvesting the giant corpses of alien gods that are found on the edge of human space. While other autopsy ships and explorers race to salvage the meat, minerals, and metals that sustain the human race, Malik sees an opportunity to finally break free from this system by being the first to find a living god. But Malik's obsession with the gods will push his crew into the darkest reaches of space, bringing them face to face with a threat unlike anything they've ever seen unless the rogue agent on their trail can stop them first. So yes, very intriguing, sci-fi, comic, I definitely want to read this. <laughs> Then we also have From Little Tokyo with Love by Sarah Kuhn. I have read Heroin Complex by Sarah Kuhn, which is the first book in her adult superhero series. However, I do believe this one is a YA contemporary. 
If Rika's life seemed like the beginning of a familiar fairy tale, being an orphan with two bossy cousins and working away in her aunt's business, she would be the first to reject that foolish notion. After all, she loves her family, even if her cousins were named after Disney characters. And with her biracial background, amazing judo skills, and red-hot temper, she doesn't quite fit the princess mold. All that changes the instant she locks eyes with Grace Kimura, America's reigning rom-com sweetheart during the Nikkei Week Festival. From there, Rika embarks on a madcap adventure of hope and happiness, searching for clues about her long-lost mother, exploring little Tokyo's hidden treasures with a cute actor, and maybe, finally, finding a sense of belonging. But fairy tales are fiction, and the real world isn't so kind. Rika knows she's setting herself up for disappointment, because happy endings don't happen to girls like her. Should she walk away before she gets in even deeper, or let herself be swept away? So, I'm mostly picking this one up because of the author. I really enjoyed her other work that I've read. She really knocked it out of the park with the superhero story, so I definitely want to try this. And then we have Thanks A Lot Universe by Chad Lucas. This one I do believe is a middle grade, and it says, Brian has always been anxious, whether at home or in class or on the basketball court. His dad tries to get him to stand up for himself, and his mom helps as much as she can. But after he and his brother are placed in foster care, Brian starts having panic attacks, and he doesn't know if things will ever be normal again. Ezra's always been popular. He's friends with most of the kids on his basketball team, even Brian, who usually keeps to himself. But now, some of his friends have been acting differently, and Brian seems to be pulling away. Ezra wants to help, but he worries if he's too nice to Brian, his friends will realize that he has a crush on him. But when Brian and his brother run away, Ezra has no choice but to take the leap and reach out. Both boys have to decide if they're willing to risk sharing parts of themselves they'd rather hide. But if they can be brave, they might just find the best in themselves and each other. So this definitely feels like it's going to be a hard-hitting middle grade, but I'm very happy that we have queer characters in here. I feel like we definitely need a lot of these characters in any age range to be more normalized. And then the last one we have for this date is Some of the Storm by Sugi Davies Okungboa. And this one says, A young scholar's ambition threatens to reshape an empire determined to retain its might in this epic tale of violent conquest, buried histories, and forbidden magic. In the thriving city of Basa, Danso is a clever but disillusioned scholar who longs for life beyond the rigid family and political obligations expected of the city's elite. A way out presents itself when Li Long, a skin-changing warrior, shows up wounded in his barn. She comes from the nameless islands, which according to Basa lore, don't exist, and neither should the mythical magic of Ibor she wields. Now swept into a conspiracy far beyond his understanding, Danso will have to set out on a journey that reveals histories violently suppressed and magic the read more on Goodreads is not working right now, but histories that are violently suppressed and some sort of magic. Moving into May 13th, I have one book that's coming out on this date and is going to be Black Heart Nights by Lore Eve. And this says, imagine Camelot but in Gotham, a city where knights are the celebrities of the day riding on motorbikes instead of horses and competing in televised fights for fame and money. Imagine a city where a young magic touched bastard astonishes everyone by becoming king, albeit with some reluctance and a girl with a secret past trains to become a knight for the sole purpose of vengeance. Imagine a city where magic is illegal, but everywhere, in its underground bars, its back alley soothsayers, and in the people who have to hide what they are for fear of being tattooed and persecuted. Imagine a city where electricity is money, power the only game worth playing, and violence the most fervently worshipped religion. Welcome to a dark, chaotic, alluring place with a tumultuous history where dreams come true if you want them hard enough, and are prepared to do some very, very bad things to get them. I don't know much more than this, but I saw this, I think, on Instagram somewhere, and the whole Camelot but Gotham sounded very intriguing, and again, cover's really cool, so yeah. <laughs> and then I also have one book coming out on May 15th, and that is going to be Phineas Fogg, Nine of Swords by Brooklyn Quintana. So this one I actually do have a physical arc for the author reached out to see if I would like to read it. I have not read it yet, I'm planning on doing that in April because it is like 770 pages I believe. Um, and Goodreads does not have any synopsis up for this, so let me see if I still have the email that talks about what this is. Okay, so on the website of the like publisher for this, because it is indie published, it says, Welcome to the Morrency Academy of Military Arts. 
As one of our students, we expect that you will fight till the end and win by any means necessary. Now that you're here, there are a few things you should be made aware of. Firstly, be mindful of the water's edge. The mermaids are not always to be trusted and the dolphins are quite unreliable. Second, try not to get lost in the catacombs. Should you wander too far, your safety cannot be guaranteed. And remember, be wary of the jungle. The trees like to rearrange themselves and do steer clear of the vines, lest you not return from your adventure intact or even alive. We hope to see you at the end of your games, should you make it that far. So, one, very intrigued by that sort of premise. Also, the fact that there might be games at the end of the year. I don't know, but this is the first book in a series. I don't know. I don't really even know if that tells us too much about what the actual story in this book is about, but I'm very intrigued by the whole like magical area, school, man-eating mermaids, like who knows? <laughs> Okay, moving to May 18th, there are six books coming out on this date, and the first one is May the Best Man Win by Z.R. Eller. And so this one should be a YA contemporary. I don't know if it's necessarily romance. I guess we will find out. Jeremy Harkis, cheer captain and student body president, won't let coming out as a transgender boy ruin his senior year. Instead of bowing to the bigots and outdated school administration, Jeremy decides to make some noise. And how better than by challenging his all-star ex-boyfriend Lucas for the title of homecoming king. Lucas Rivers, football star and head of the homecoming committee, is just trying to find order in his life after his older brother's funeral and the loss of his long-term girlfriend who turned out to be a boy. But when Jeremy threatens to break his heart and steal his crown, Lucas kickstarts a plot to sabotage Jeremy's campaign. When both boys take their rivalry too far, the dance is on the verge of being cancelled. To save homecoming, they'll have to face the hurt they're both hiding and the lingering butterflies they can't deny. This is telling me there might be romance. I don't want to get my hopes up for it. I'm going to just strictly say why a contemporary, but if there is romance involved, I would be very happy about that. Then we also have Rosalind Palmer Takes the Cake by Alexis Hall. Alexis Hall wrote boyfriend material that came out last year. I absolutely love that. And this is the first in a new series. As far as I know, at least one main character is going to be bi. So that is very exciting. Following the recipe is the key to a successful bake. Rosalind Palmer has always lived by those rules. Well, except for when she dropped out of college to raise her daughter Amelie. Now with a paycheck as useful as grease-proof paper and a house crumbling faster than biscuits and tea, she's teetering on the edge of financial disaster. But where there's a whisk, there's a way. Sorry, I'm loving this so far. Where there's a whisk, there's a way. And Rosalind has just landed a spot on the nation's most beloved baking show. Winning the prize money would give her daughter the life she deserves, and Rosalind is determined to stick to the instructions. However, more than collapsing trifles stand between Rosalind and sweet, sweet victory. Suave, well-educated, and parent-approved Elaine Pope knows all the right moves to sweep her off her feet. But it's shy electrician Harry Dobson who makes Rosalind question her long-held beliefs about herself, her family, and her desires. Rosalind fears falling for Harry is a guaranteed recipe for disaster, yet as the competition and the ovens heat up, Rosalind starts to realize the most delicious bakes come from the heart. Now, I think I might have started pronouncing the character and the title's name differently halfway through, so I don't know if this is actually Rosalind or Rosalind, but either way, I'm excited for this. Then we have The Soulmate Equation by Christina Lauren. Everybody seems to be hyped up about Christina Lauren. I have never read a Christina Lauren, but the premise of this one gets me really excited to try this out. Single mom Jess Davis is a data and statistics wizard, but no amount of number crunching can convince her to step back into the dating world. Raised by her grandparents, who now help raise her seven-year-old daughter, Juno, Jess has been left behind too often to feel comfortable letting anyone in. After all, her father's never been around, her hard partying mother disappeared when she was six, and her ex decided he wasn't father material before Juno was even born. Jess holds her loved ones close, but constantly working to stay afloat is hard and lonely. But then Jess hears about Genetically, a buzzy new DNA-based matchmaking company that's predicted to change dating forever. Finding a soulmate through DNA? The reliability of numbers. This Jess understands. At least she thought she did, until her test shows an unheard of 98% compatibility with another subject in the database, Genetically's founder, Dr. River Pena. This is one number she can't wrap her head around because she already knows Dr. Pena. The stuck-up, stubborn man is without a doubt not her soulmate. 
but genetically has a proposition. Get to know him and we'll pay you. Jess, who is barely making ends meet, is in no position to turn it down despite her skepticism about the project and her dislike for River. As the pair are dragged from one event to the next, as the diamond pairing that could make genetically a mint in the stock prices, Jess begins to realize that there might be more to the scientist and the science behind a soulmate than she thought science-based romance novel like I'm very very intrigued it also sounds like maybe not necessarily enemies to lovers or rivals to lovers because we don't really know much about him or how she knows him and knows they're not compatible but I'm very very intrigued. Then we also have Goblin by Josh Mallerman so this is a novel told in six novellas. I know this came out as self-published or a special edition or something a few years ago but a more readily available book is coming out now and so I'm very intrigued by the whole premise of this. These six novellas tell the story of a place where the rain is always falling, nighttime is always near, and your darkest fears and desires await. Welcome to Goblin. So a man in slices, a man proves his legendary love to his girlfriend with a sacrifice even more daring than Vincent van Gogh's and sends her more than his heart. Camp. Walter Camp is afraid of everything, but mostly afraid of being scared to death. As he sets traps around his home to catch the ghosts that haunt him, he learns that nothing is more terrifying than fear itself. Happy Birthday Hunter. A famed big game hunter is determined to capture and kill the ultimate prey, the mythic great owl who lives in Goblin's Dark Forest. But this mysterious creature is not the only secret the woods are keeping. Presto. All Peter wants is to be like his hero, Roman Emperor, the greatest magician in the world. When the famous magician comes to Goblin, Peter discovers that not all magic is just an illusion. A mix-up at the zoo, the new zookeeper feels a mysterious kinship with the animals in his care and finds that his work is freeing dark forces inside him. And the hedges. When his wife dies, a man builds a hedge maze so elaborate no one ever solves it, until a little girl resolves to be the first to find the mysteries that wait at its heart. So I'm not always the biggest fan of short story collections, and I know these are more novellas, but the fact that they're all supposed to sort of intertwine to make this one book definitely has me intrigued. Like, I sort of need to know how that all fits together. Then we have In the Ravenous Dark by A.M. Strickland, and this one says, A pansexual blood mage reluctantly teams up with an undead spirit to start a rebellion among the living and the dead. In Thinopolis, those gifted with magic are assigned undead spirits to guide them and control them. Ever since Robin's father died trying to keep her from this fate, she's hidden her magic. But when she accidentally reveals her powers, she's bound to a spirit and thrust into a world of palace intrigue and deception. Desperate to escape, Rovin finds herself falling for two people she can't fully trust. Ledea, a beguiling, rebellious princess, and Inverlos, the handsome spirit with the ability to control Rovin, body and soul. Together they uncover a secret that will destroy Thinopolis. To save them all, Rovin will have to start a rebellion in both the mortal world and the underworld, and find a way to trust the princess and spirit battling for her heart if she doesn't betray them first. I definitely want to know what this is about. The cover is also just like perfectly spooky for this. I love it. And then the last one for this date is Shipped by Meredith Tate. Stella Green and Wesley Clark are Jean Connolly Memorial High School's biggest rivals. While the two have been battling it out for top student, it's a race to the bottom when it comes to snide comments and pulling the dirtiest prank. For years, Stella and Wes have been the villain in each other's story, and now it's an all-out war. And there is no bigger battle than the one for valedictorian, and more specifically, the coveted valedictorian scholarship. But Stella and Wes have more in common than they think. Both are huge fans of Warship 7, a popular sci-fi TV drama with a dedicated online following, and the two start chatting under aliases, without a clue that their rival is just beyond the screen. They realize that they're both attending SciCon this year, so they plan to dress in their best cosplay and finally meet in real life. While tensions at school are rising and SciCon inches closer and closer, the enemy lines between Stella and Wes blur when a class project shows them they might understand one another better than anyone else, and not just in cosplay. But I love the cover and I definitely want to see where this one goes. Okay, and then there are three titles coming out on May 25th. The first one we have here is Hang the Moon by Alexandria Bellaflor. This is the sequel to Written in the Stars, although I do believe it is a companion novel because I own the first one, haven't read it yet, but the second one is coming out. Brendan Lowell finds love. It's why he created a dating app to help people find their one true pairing and why he's convinced the one is out there, even if he hasn't met her yet. Or has he? When his sister's best friend turns up in Seattle unexpectedly, Brendan jumps at the chance to hang out with her. He's crushed on Annie since they were kids, and the stars have finally aligned, putting them in the same city at the same time. 
Annie booked a spur of the moment trip to Seattle to spend time with friends before moving across the globe. She's not looking for love, especially with her best friend's brother. Annie remembers Brendan as a sweet dorky kid, except the six foot four man who shows up at her door is a certified hot nerd and Annie wants him? Oh yes. Getting involved would be a terrible idea. Her stay is temporary and he wants forever. But when Brendan learns Annie has given up on dating, he's determined to prove that romance is real. Taking cues from his favorite rom-coms, Brendan plans to woo her with elaborate dates straight out of Nora Ephron's playbook. The clock is ticking on Annie's time in Seattle and Brendan's starting to realize romance isn't just flowers and chocolate. But maybe real love doesn't need to be as perfect as the movies as long as you think your partner hung the moon. So again, sounds very, very cute. It's an adult romance. It does also say this is an own voices queer rom-com. So I don't know if that means one or both characters is bi or how that works, but just keep that in mind. Then we have How to Find a Princess by Alyssa Cole. So this is going to be another adult romance and it's a queer Anastasia retelling. Okay, this sounds really good. Makeda Hicks has lost her job and her girlfriend in one fell swoop. The last thing she's in the mood for is to rehash the story of her grandmother's infamous summer fling with a runaway prince from Iberania or the investigator from the World Federation of Monarchies tasked with searching for Iberania's missing heir. Yet when Besneria Chechevalare crashes into her life, the sleek and sexy investigator exudes exactly the kind of chaos that organized and efficient Makeda finds irresponsible. Even if Bez is determined to drag her into a world of royal duty, Makeda wants nothing to do with it. When a threat to her grandmother's livelihood pushes Makeda to agree to return to Iberania, Bez takes her on a transatlantic adventure with a crew of lovable weirdos, a fake marriage, and one bed hijinks on the high seas. When they finally make it to Iberania, they realize there's more at stake than just cash and crown, and Makeda must learn what it means to fight for what she desires and not what she feels bound to by duty. I'm very, very excited. Again, we have a fake marriage thing here, so like fake dating going on. I'm just very excited for this. And the last one on May 25th is Tokyo Ever After by Emiko Jean. Crazy Rich Asians meets the Princess Diaries. Izumi Tanaka has never really felt like she fit in. It isn't easy being Japanese American in her small, mostly white, Northern California town. Raised by a single mother, it's always been Izumi or Izzy because it's easier this way, and her mom against the world. But then Izzy discovers a clue to her previously unknown father's identity, and he's none other than the crown prince of Japan, which means outspoken, irreverent Izzy is literally a princess. In a whirlwind, Izzy travels to Japan to meet the father she never knew and discover the country she's always dreamed of. But being a princess isn't all ball gowns and tiaras. There are conniving cousins, a hungry press, a scowling but handsome bodyguard who just might be her soulmate, and thousands of years of tradition and customs to learn practically overnight. Izzy soon finds herself caught between worlds and between versions of herself. Back home, she was never American enough, and in Japan, she must prove she's Japanese enough. Will Izumi crumble under the weight of the crown, or will she live out her fairy tale happily ever after? Very, very excited for this. Also seems like we're having some bodyguard romance, and yes please. And then I have a whopping 11 books coming out on June 1st. And the first one we have here is Ace of Spades by Farida Abika Iyimida. And this one is Gossip Girl Meets Get Out. When two Nivea's private academy students, Devin Richards and Chiamaka Adebayo, are selected to be part of the elite school's senior class prefix, it looks like their year is off to an amazing start. After all, not only does it look great on college applications, but it officially puts each of them in the running for valedictorian, too. Shortly after the announcement is made, though, someone who goes by ACES begins using anonymous text messages to reveal secrets about the two of them that turn their lives upside down and threaten every aspect of their carefully planned futures. As ACES shows no sign of stopping, what seemed like a sick prank quickly turns into a dangerous game with all the cards stacked against them. Can Devin and Chiamaka stop aces before things become incredibly deadly? So this definitely sounds like some sort of dark academia thriller thing. I believe it is YA. I'm very, very excited about this one. Then we have The Ghosts We Keep by Mason Deaver. When Liam Cooper's older brother Ethan is killed in a hit and run, Liam has to not only learn to face the world without one of the people he loved the most, but also face the fading relationship with his two best friends. Feeling more alone and isolated than ever, Liam finds himself sharing time with Marcus, Ethan's best friend. And through Marcus, Liam finds the one person that seemed to know exactly what they're going through for the better and the worse. This book is about grief, but it is also about why we live, why we have to keep moving on, and why we should. Definitely very excited about this. It does seem like it's going to be very hard hitting, but I do love books that make me cry, so I feel like that's definitely gonna be this one. 
And then we have Rhea and the Blood of the Nectar by Payal Doshi. So this is going to be a middle grade fantasy, I believe, and it does say that it is for fans of Arusha and Chronicles of Narnia. It all begins on the night Rhea turns 12. After a big fight with her twin brother Rohan on their birthday, Rhea's life in the small village of Darjeeling, India gets turned on its head. It's four in the morning and Rohan is nowhere to be found. It hasn't even been a day and Amma acts like Rohan's gone forever. Her grandmother, too, is behaving strangely. Unwilling to give up on her brother, Rhea and her friend Leela meet Mishti Dadi, a wrinkly old fortune teller whose powers of divination set them off on a thrilling and secret quest. In the shade of night, they portal into an otherworldly realm and travel to Astranthia, a land full of magic and whimsy. There, with the help of Zeranther, an Astranthian barrow boy, and Flula, a parry, Rhea battles serpent lilies and blood-sucking banshees, encounters a butterfly-faced woman and blue lizard men, and learns that Rohan has been captured. Okay. I feel like there's a lot in this summary and I don't want to spoil myself for anything, but it definitely seems like middle grade, portal fantasy, she's going to go like save her twin brother. I'm very excited. Then we also have The Witch King by H.E. Edgman. Wyatt would give anything to forget where he came from, but a kingdom demands its king. In Azalyn, Fey rule and witches like Wyatt Croft don't. Wyatt's betrothal to his best friend, Fey Prince Emmer North, was supposed to change that. But when Wyatt lost control of his magic one devastating night, he fled to the human world. Now a coldly distant Emmer has hunted him down. Despite transgender Wyatt's newfound identity and troubling past, Emmer has no intention of dissolving their engagement. In fact, he claims they must marry now or risk losing the throne. Jaded, Wyatt strikes a deal with the enemy, hoping to escape Azalyn forever. But as he gets to know Emmer, Wyatt realizes the boy he once loved may still exist. And as the witches face worsening conditions, he must decide once and for all what's more important, his people or his freedom. Okay, is this the second book where we have somebody coming out as trans and people being completely okay having a romance with them because I feel like that needs to happen more often. I want all of the support for these characters so, so much. Then we have The Nature of Witches by Rachel Griffin. First of all, cover, gorgeous. For centuries, witches have maintained the climate, their power from the sun peaking in the season of their birth, but now their control is faltering as the atmosphere becomes more erratic. All hope lies with Clara, an ever-witch whose rare magic is tied to every season. In autumn, Clara wants nothing to do with her power. It's wild and volatile, and the price of her magic, losing the one she loves, is too high despite the need to control the increasingly dangerous weather. In winter, the world is on the precipice of disaster. Fires burn, storms rage, and Clara accepts that she's the only one who can make a difference. In spring, she falls for Sang, the witch training her. As her magic grows, so do her feelings until she's terrified Sang will be the next one she loses. In summer, Clara must choose between her power and her happiness, her duty and the people she loves, before she loses Sang, her magic, and thrusts the world into chaos. Practical magic meets Twister in this debut contemporary fantasy. Interesting, okay. Then we have The Library of the Dead by T.L. Huchu. Sixth Sense meets Stranger Things. Okay, so a lot of these summaries seem to have those like comparisons in them and those are all getting me very excited to read these. When a child goes missing in Edinburgh's darkest streets, young Ropa investigates. She'll need to call on Zimbabwean magic as well as her Scottish pragmatism to hunt down clues. But as shadows lengthen, will the hunter become the hunted? When ghosts talk, she will listen. Ropa dropped out of school to become a ghost talker. Now she speaks to Edinburgh's dead, carrying messages to the living. A girl's gotta earn a living, and it seems harmless enough. Until, that is, the dead whisper that someone's bewitching children, leaving them husks empty of joy in life. It's on Ropa's patch, so she feels honor-bound to investigate. But what she learns will change her world. She'll dice with death, not part of her plan, discovering an occult library and a taste for hidden magic. She'll also experience dark times, for Edinburgh hides a wealth of secrets, and Ropa's gonna hunt them all down. Okay. I'm, I'm really on board with that. Again, loving, loving this cover. I want to see what this is all about. Then we have Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June. There's one thing Jay Collier knows for sure. He's a statistical anomaly as the only out gay kid in his small rural Washington town. While all his friends can't stop talking about their heterosexual hookups and relationships, Jay can only dream of his own first, compiling a romance to-do list of all the things he hopes to one day experience, his gay agenda. 
Then, against all odds, Jay's family moves to Seattle, and he starts his senior year at a new high school with a thriving LGBTQIA plus community. For the first time ever, Jay feels like he's found where he truly belongs, where he can flirt with very sexy boys and search for love. But as Jay begins crossing items off his list, he'll soon be torn between his heart and his hormones, his old friends and his new ones. Because after all, life and love doesn't always go according to plan. I'm very, very intrigued by this as well. I am absolutely loving all the queer YA stuff coming out, queer middle grade stuff too, but we definitely need more books like these. And then we have One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston. I absolutely love Red, White, and Royal Blue. I believe this is another new adult adult romance, but I think there is, what, a time travel element? Um, okay, the read more on this isn't fully working very well either, but... It's a queer spin on Kate and Leopold. It says a 23-year-old realizes her subway crush is displaced from 1970s Brooklyn, and she must do everything in her power to help her and try not to fall in love with the girl lost in time before it's, I think it said too late, but I tried to push read more. Uh, it doesn't say anything else, but definitely loved Casey McQuiston's previous work, and so I definitely need to try this one. And then we have The Nishan Smile by C.J. Merwild. This one is going to be a self-published type of book, and I'm very excited because Merwild is a great artist. We actually get a lot of their artistic work in, like, book boxes and stuff like that, and they have, I think, spent, like, two years writing this book, and so I have Try not to get my hopes up too much, but like, it sounds very intriguing. The gods smiled upon their offspring from the skies, loving and generous, but that was before. For the sky is now tainted and the people deprived of their creators overnight have been orphans for nearly two centuries. Since that fateful day, the corruption has reigned over the world. It defiled the clouds, covered the lands with a veil of darkness. The first conflicts arose in the east of the Cormoran continent, some under the impulse of beliefs calling for blood and flames. As hatred continues to spread, the vanished gods no longer answering any prayers, some fight for a peaceful life. In the midst of this madness, two children need each other. One of them is human, the other is Nishan. The boys are two opposite minds and fates, yet connected irrevocably. The days, then the passing years, bring them together. But life reminds them of their differences and works to crush the remnants of their innocence. Between joys and sorrows, friendship and savagery, a smile is sometimes enough to change everything. Now this is for sure an adult book. There are a ton of trigger warnings that are included here. Um, it says it has graphic violence, violence against children and animals, explicit sexual content, and explicit language. Reader discretion is advised. I do love the fact that they put the trigger warnings at the bottom of the synopsis, but I've heard lots of good things. I follow them on Instagram, and so when they've been answering like questions about their book, it just makes me more intrigued. And then we have The Girl from the Sea by Molly Ostertag. And this one I do believe is a graphic novel. 15 year old Morgan has a secret. She can't wait to escape the perfect little island where she lives. She's desperate to finish high school and escape her sad divorced mom, her volatile little brother, and worst of all, her great group of friends who don't understand Morgan at all. Because really, Morgan's biggest secret is that she has a lot of secrets, including the one about wanting to kiss another girl. Then one night, Morgan is saved from drowning by a mysterious girl named Kelty. The two become friends, and suddenly life on the island doesn't seem so stifling anymore. But Kelty has some secrets of her own, and as the girls start to fall in love, everything they're each trying to hide will find its way to the surface, whether Morgan is ready or not. Yes, it is a graphic novel. Since Morgan is 15, maybe this is a young adult graphic novel, but... I'm very, very excited for this. And then the last one for the state is The Darkness Outside Us by Elliot Schrafer. Two boys alone in space. After the first settler on Titan trips her distress signal, neither remaining country on Earth can afford to scramble a rescue of its own. And so two sworn enemies are installed in the same spaceship. Ambrose wakes up on the coordinated endeavor with no memory of a launch. There's more that doesn't add up. Evidence indicates strangers have been on board. The ship's operating system is voiced by his mother, and his handsome brooding shipmate has barricaded himself away. But nothing will stop Ambrose from making his mission succeed. Not when he's rescuing his own sister. In order to survive the ship's secrets, Ambrose and Kodiak will need to work together and learn to trust one another, especially once they discover what they are truly up against. Love might be the only way to survive. So I definitely knew this was going to be like a sci-fi in space between the two boys. I don't think I remembered anything about going to save someone, but obviously that ups our stakes and I'm very excited. Then there are three books coming out on June 8th. The first one here is 1500 Miles from the Sun by Johnny Garzavia. 
Julian Luna has a plan for his life. Graduate, get into UCLA, and have the chance to move away from Corpus Christi, Texas, and the suffocating expectations of others that have forced Jules into an unauthentic life. Then, in one reckless moment, with one impulsive tweet, his plans for a low-key nine months are thrown, literally, out of the closet. The downside? The whole world knows, and Jules has to prepare for rejection. The upside? Jules now has the opportunity to be his real self. Then Matt, a cute, empathetic Twitter crush from Los Angeles, slides into Jules' DMs. Jules can tell him anything. Matt makes the world seem conquerable. But when Jules' fears about coming out come true, the person he needs most is 1,500 miles away. Jules has to face them alone. Jules accidentally propelled himself into the life he's always dreamed of, and now that he's in control of it, what he does next is up to him. So again, another queer, I'm pretty sure YA, contemporary. I'm very excited. And then we have The Marvelous by Claire Kahn. Everyone thinks they know Jewel Van Hannen, heiress turned actress turned social media darling who created the massively popular video sharing app Golden Rule. After mysteriously disappearing for a year, Jewel makes her dramatic return with an announcement. She has chosen a few lucky Golden Rule users to spend an unforgettable weekend at her private estate. But once they arrive, Jewel ingeniously flips the script. The guests are now players in an elaborate estate-wide game and she's tailored every challenge and obstacle to test whether they have what it takes to win at any cost. Told from the perspective of three dazzling players, Nicole, the new queen of golden rule, Luna, Jewel's biggest fan, and Stella, a brilliant outsider, this novel will charm its way into your heart and keep you guessing how it all ends because money isn't the only thing at stake. Okay, I'm all for some sort of game or competition, and yes, I think this is going to be really, really cool. And then we also have The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. Imprisoned by her dictator brother, Malini spends her days in isolation in the Harana, an ancient temple that was once the source of the powerful, magical, deathless waters, but is now little more than a decaying ruin. Priya is a maidservant, one among several who make the treacherous journey to the top of Harana every night to clean Malini's chambers. She is happy to be an anonymous drudge, so long as it keeps anyone from guessing the dangerous secret she hides. But when Malini accidentally bears witness to Priya's true nature, their destinies become irrevocably tangled. One is a vengeful princess seeking to depose her brother from his throne. The other is a priestess seeking to find her family. Together they will change the fate of an empire. So this is, I think, an epic fantasy, and it's going to be inspired by the history and epics of India. So yes, very excited for this one as well. And then there are four books coming out on June 15th. The first one is BB Free Volume 1 by Gabby Rivera and Royal Dunlap. So this one I think was supposed to come out last year because I know I was super excited to read this and I'm pretty sure it got pushed back, but we are, we are getting there. We are slowly getting there. And this is going to be a trade paperback comic bind up. It's been over 20 years since the plague that ate greed wiped out half the population, and it's the only world that BB has ever known. Broadcasting her underground radio show from her remote swamp community, BB Free has no idea about the world outside her home or her role in it. But when BB discovers a terrible secret about her overbearing father, she realizes that everything she believes in could be a lie. Now on the run from her own family, BB will learn the truth about the world she lives in and about the power she never knew she had. I'm absolutely excited about this. The cover is gorgeous. And I know Ashley from Bookish Realm, I believe, read the individual issues and enjoyed it. So that's part of the reason I want to read this. And then we have Blood Like Magic by LaSalle Sambury. After years of waiting for her calling, a trial every witch must pass in order to come into their powers, the one thing Voya Thomas didn't expect was to fail. When Voya's ancestor gives her an unprecedented second chance to complete her calling, she agrees, and then is horrified when her task is to kill her first love. And this time, failure means every Thomas witch will be stripped of their magic. Voya is determined to save her family's magic no matter the cost. The problem is, Voya has never been in love, so for her to succeed, she'll first have to find the perfect guy, and fast. Fortunately, a genetic matchmaking program has just hit the market. Her plan is to join the program, fall in love, and complete her task before the deadline. What she doesn't count on is being paired with the infuriating Luke. How can she fall in love with a guy who seemingly wants nothing to do with her? With mounting pressure from her family, Voya is caught between her morality and her duty to her bloodline. If she wants to save their heritage and Luke, she'll have to find something her ancestor wants more than blood. And in witchcraft, blood is everything. Okay, I definitely knew about the magic aspect. I don't think I actually knew about the whole DNA matchmaking thing again, because we just had a book about that earlier. So is this like, this is more of a contemporary fantasy with like obvious technology. I'm very into this. And then we have Something is Killing the Children, Volume 3 by James Tinian IV. 
Illustrations by Werther Deladera. So this one, I don't think I'm going to read the synopsis on here because I've read the first two volumes. I absolutely love this comic series, and so I need the third one. But basically the first one and all of them follow this town where kids have been disappearing. However, they're not just disappearing. There are actual monsters. Monsters are real, and they are killing the children. And Erica Slaughter is a new girl coming into town to sort of help try to kill the monster. And it is very, very dark very bloody and I need more in this series so I definitely need volume three. And then we also have For the Wolf by Hannah Witten. The first daughter is For the Throne. The second daughter is For the Wolf. As the only second daughter born in centuries, Red has one purpose, to be sacrificed to the wolf in the wood in the hope he'll return the world's captured gods. Red is almost relieved to go. Plagued by a dangerous power she can't control, at least she knows that in the Wilderwood she can't hurt those she loves. Again, but the legends lie. The wolf is a man, not a monster. Her magic is a calling, not a curse. And if she doesn't learn how to use it, the monsters the gods have become will swallow the Wilderwood and her world whole. I am very excited for this. I don't know much else. The cover, again, very, very gorgeous. But yes, I need to read this. Okay, we're getting down to the last ones. We have two coming out on June 22nd. The first one is Darling by Kay Ankrum. This is a Peter Pan retelling, and I'm very excited. On Wendy Darling's first night in Chicago, a boy called Peter appears at her window. He's dizzying, captivating, beautiful, so she agrees to join him for a night on the town. Wendy thinks they're heading to a party, but instead they're soon running in the city's underground. She makes friends, a punk girl named Tinkerbell, and the lost boys Peter watches over. And she makes enemies, the terrifying detective Hook, and maybe Peter himself, as his sinister secrets start coming to light. Can Wendy find the courage to survive this night and make sure everyone else does too? Again, I don't really need to know more Peter Pan retelling. Yes, I need, I need this. And the cover, again, can I say it enough? Gorgeous. <laughs> and then we have Blackout, which is about six different love stories, I believe, and it is like an anthology collection. So the authors we have here are Danielle Clayton, Tiffany G. Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and Nicola Yoon. A summer heat wave blankets New York City in darkness, but as the city is thrown into confusion, a different kind of electricity sparks. A first meeting, longtime friends, bitter exes, and maybe the beginning of something new. When the lights go out, people reveal hidden truths. Love blossoms, friendship transforms, and new possibilities take flight. Beloved authors celebrate the beauty of six couples and the unforgettable magic that can be found on a sweltering starry night in this city. I think I said it earlier, I'm not the best with like short stories, but there's something about this one and the fact that it's all set like on the same night and it seems like a lot of them are going to be romance. I, there's just something about it. And then finally, there are two books coming out on June 29th. The first one is Eat Your Heart Out by Kelly DeVos. Shaun of the Dead meets Dumplin'. I'm excited already. I love Shaun the Dead. Vivian Ellenshaw is fat, but she knows she doesn't need to lose weight, so she's none too happy to find herself forced into a weight loss camp's van with her ex-best friend Allie, a meathead jock who can barely drive, and the camp owner's snobby son. And when they arrive at Camp Featherlight at the start of the worst blizzard in the history of Flagstaff, Arizona, Okay, I live in Arizona. I did not know this took place in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm even more excited. I used to live there. It's clear that something isn't right. V barely has a chance to meet the other members of her pod, all who seem as unhappy to be at Featherlight as she does, when a camper goes missing down by the lake. Then she spots something horrifying outside in the snow. Something that isn't human. Plus, the camp's supposed miracle cure for obesity just seems fishy, and V and her fellow campers know they don't need to be cured of anything. Even worse, it's not long before Camp Featherlight's luxurious bungalows are totally overrun with zombies. What starts out as a mission to unravel the camp's secrets turns into a desperate fight for survival, and not all of Featherlight's campers will make it out alive. A satirical blend of horror, body positivity, and humor. I'm even more excited. This cover is what drew me in at first. I really, really need to read this one. Like, so much. And then finally, the last one from April, May, and June is Gear Breakers by Zoe Hannah Makuda. We went past praying to deities and started to build them instead. The shadow of Godolia's tyrannical rule is spreading, aided by their giant mechanized weapons known as wind-ups. War and oppression are everyday constants for the people of the Badlands, who live under the thumb of their cruel Godolia overlords. Eris Shin Danai is a gearbreaker, a brash young rebel who specializes in taking down wind-ups from the inside. 
When one of her missions goes awry and she finds herself in a Godolia prison, Eris meets Sona Steelcrest, a cybernetically enhanced wind-up pilot. At first, Eris sees Sona as her mortal enemy, but Sona has a secret. She has intentionally infiltrated the wind-up program to destroy Godolia from within. As the clock ticks down to their deadliest mission yet, a direct attack to end Godolia's reign once and for all, Eris and Sona grow closer as comrades, friends, and perhaps something more. I am so excited. This is definitely some sort of sci-fi mech sort of situation. <sighs> and it is queer. I am so ready for this. Again, cover is gorgeous. This is the last time I can say this for this video. Cover is gorgeous. And that is all 61 books that I'm excited for for April, May, and June of 2021. <sighs> Hopefully my video next time is not this long, but that just means there are so many cool books coming out and I will never, never have time to read them all. That, that is a little bit devastating, but I'm so excited. I hope you guys found some new books that you're excited for. And if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up to let me know. Subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see more videos. I do have videos up Mondays, Thursdays, and sometimes Saturdays. So I will see you then. Bye.